Good morning, everybody. It's really great to be here, finally. There's been a lot of planning that's gone on. And I certainly want to thank MAS. There probably couldn't be a better venue for us to be talking about our project at 425 Park Avenue. The project is going to require a lot more than a developer. It's going to require support from the community. It's going to require support from our investors. It's going to require support from the city. Something I like to think of as a grand collaboration of all of the stakeholders. We need to find a balance between our commercial interests as fiduciaries for our investors and for the community in building this timeless structure. As we move this project forward, you'll see outside some of the process that we went through, and I encourage you to go ahead and, and look at the display, not only on 425 Park, but on the other architects that have been involved in working with us. You can actually hear the architects, you can listen to them, there's iPads. It's really quite impressive. And it was a phenomenal experience for all of us to share 425 Park Avenue with those people. The first thing that's most important is the opportunity. And it's very important for everyone to understand what that is. For the first time in 47 years, there is going to be a vacant block front site on Park Avenue. Really the first time in most of our lifetimes. And quite frankly, I think it's going to be the last time in our lifetimes. The idea of getting a vacant building on Park Avenue is really quite extraordinary. So with this opportunity, as the developers putting together this grand collaboration against a variety of headwinds and challenges, what we really needed to do was find an organization and an architect that not only shared our vision, but enhanced our vision. With all of the challenges and effort that goes into something, Perhaps the most important thing is the human will that it will take to construct and develop this building. The will of the organization of l and Holding Company, the will of Lord Foster and his organization, the amalgam of those two strong wills forged together in the steel that will rise out of the site. This morning now, I'd like to introduce you again to my partner, friend, Lord Norman Foster. Good morning. <clears throat> I'd like to um, share with you uh, some of the influences on 425 and our proposals for the project. It starts, I guess, as the existing building in the mid-1950s. And this is the cover to the brochure of the time. And in the mid-50s, it talks breathlessly about the cutting-edge technology of air conditioning and fluorescent light tubes. And, um, and in a way, we can see the building there. And I would say that the first um, influence is the grid of New York and the streetscape, which transcends the architecture. And in a sense, all of the buildings here contribute to that space. And historically, and we were talking about this uh, yesterday, this image of 19. Uh, 13. And um, although the buildings are different, uh, the streetscape is essentially the same, except for the occasional landmark buildings. The church here has its own space, it sets back. Uh, and in that sense, draws some attention to it with the space in front of it. But again, over time, and this is in the mid-50s, before the Pan Am building. But again, that extraordinary urbanity, the configuration of the pedestrian realm and the roads has changed.
But what has not changed and is timeless is that grid and a second influence, the way in which the buildings set back and give a richness to the skyline, and again, is unmistakably of New York. And I guess that we all have uh, influences in our hero figures, and Hugh Ferris in the mid-30s kind of captured that with his graphite charcoal renderings, which was all about uh, the sculptural effect of those setbacks. And um, again, coming closer in time to the Park Avenue of today, again, that consistent urbanity, except on occasions with the landmark building which will set back and which will create a public space, a civic space. Um, and it's the fact that these happen occasionally, that they add the kind of spice to the otherwise, um, uh, I wouldn't say anonymity of the, of the civic spaces, the streets. And quite interestingly, I can remember uh, over time the different installations of public contemporary art which have graced the forecourt of this wonderful uh, Seagram building. And so if that idea of the civic space of creating a living room, but at the same time capturing the street edge, a kind of balancing act where we didn't want to set back, we wanted to preserve the edge of the street. So here what we're suggesting um, is that there is, as it were, a living room, a showcase for contemporary art, which will change perhaps every six months. Here, if you like, is the, uh, is the current exhibition of, um, of Calder. And here we can see it under a ceiling, which is probably itself an installation by an artist to perhaps bring changing color uh, to that, uh, very, very gently kind of morphing over time. But here you see it's balancing that need for a public space, an enlargement of the public realm, and at the same time reinforcing the street edge. Now, um, the needs of the office market uh, have changed over time. And in our conversations with David and his team, the desire to be able to provide not just a single type of space, but a rich mix of spaces, some of which are shallow, some of which are deeper. So here, there's a wonderful synergy between those civic responsibilities and the desire to produce something which will be almost unique on the market in terms of the quality and the variety of spaces that it will provide. So here at the base, the deep space, but I'll talk a little bit about that uh, later. <clears throat> this is a combination of one of the many sketches and the wider team. So here we are. Um, this must have been, uh, looking at the date there, the 2nd of August. Well, that was when the sketch was done and the meeting was, was round about that time. So here, in the process of evolving the design is a kind of to and froing, um, advocating what as designers from what we had heard, observed and researched, we felt was appropriate for the project, and then being the good listener, understanding the needs that generate this building. And if those needs are not met, then the building doesn't happen. So, um, so in a way, the wider team, and here in that sketch you can see uh, repeated um, the uh, the street edge and then the building growing and, uh, and relating in the public domain to the skyline. You can see our engineer, Roger Risdell smith over there, and you can see the, uh, the transfer of that structural engineering knowledge working in a totally integrated way to have the way in which five bays can become four bays, can become three bays as the structural uh, load. So at the same time, woven into this, trying to find a high performance structure, which in its own elegance will be doing more with less. And um, talking about the breakdown of those spaces, we have the low rise, the mid rise, and the high rise, and quite um, a variety in that. 
here we start to see the way in which a building is served by a core traditionally in the center. We move that to one side, we kind of stretch it out so it's giving the maximum amount of flexible space. It's tapering to the top as the elevator needs diminish, um, and then it has a very clearly expressed structure, which is creating column-free spaces uh, within uh, those offices. And we extend the cores uh, skywards as a final flourish, which will probably be a collaboration with an artist in terms of how those are interpreted on the night skyline. <coughs> So really coming back and seeing that process as we have the structure which diminishes, the bays diminish, we have a degree of stiffening and triangulation, we celebrate those setbacks in the same historic manner as Hugh Ferris and those early 1930s renderings. And here you can see uh, the shear walls of the core just uh, gently extended. Um, talking a little bit about the flexibility of the spaces here. We're looking at the deeper spaces at the base, and then we're seeing the way in which they might adapt to different kinds of organizations, different lifestyles, different ways of working. How adaptable could they be? Could they take an auditorium, for example? Um, and then as we move to the more shallow plates, and you can see the way in which the core, uh, the back is adapting to that, and then exploring through modeling different ways in, in which different kinds of organizations could work, what the lifestyle might be, anticipating the needs in the future. And then the narrower floors, different kinds of layouts which might work with those. Um, and then finally, reversing that, looking at it at night, um, seeing how, and I'll show you later, those spaces, the celebratory spaces might work in terms of providing kind of club facilities for the building. And again, always the clear verticality of the structure. What you're not seeing here is the different expression on the other side of it, which is much more in a kind of different spirit because it doesn't have the needs uh, of glazing. And then eventually, of course, coming to the pinnacle of the building, and marking that on the, um, on the skyline. And then seeing how those spaces would work from the inside. Mindful always that this building is a fusion of, of the internal needs, which are essentially private, and the external needs, which are in the public domain. And again, extraordinary views at these transfer levels. So celebrating the sculptural possibilities and the celebration of the way in which the bays diminish and the, and, and, and the structure triangulates for strength at those vital, uh, those vital junctions. And then this is the, uh, the elevation to the core, very different. But again, in that very New York tradition, almost evocative in some ways of a past architecture. I can think of Rockefeller Center with the verticality uh, of the glazing. And finally, uh, on the skyline, from the distance, but still very much in that uh, civic domain. Thank you very much. <laughs>